On this episode of Skeptico. Wait a minute. I've heard you say this before. Do you think for a second that this idea that recasting uh, Jesus from this uh, born of a virgin, son of God, God on earth being to someone who's well schooled in and theogens and healing, there is no way that's going to fly with modern day Christianity. Whether you believe in all the other uh, stories about the Bible, you can, and it is not contradictory to a belief system that says that Jesus was the Son of God, if that is your belief, to contemplate that he could have realized his divinity through entheogens. Stay with us for Skeptico. Welcome to Skeptico, where we explore controversial science and spirituality with leading researchers, thinkers, and their critics. Of course, have to have their critics in there. I'm your host, Alex Sakaris. And on this episode, a really interesting topic that we've touched on only slightly here and there, and I'm glad to bring it center stage. Dr. Jerry Brown, along with his wife, Julie Brown, have written a book, The Psychedelic Gospels. So the issue here is something you've probably heard about, you know, were psychedelics a part of early Christian history? Spoiler alert, yes, they were. Here's an anthropologist who has looked into it extensively and kind of nailed it. He has all the artwork, all the analysis, all the stuff. That's kind of beyond question. But of course, this is skeptical. We want to go much further than that. And the questions that I really want to pull apart were, A, what does that mean? Does it mean like some atheists take it that Christianity is just bunk because those were just tripping. You know, I mean, that's the that's the the takeaway there from the atheist side. Now, there's another side. There's a super progressive Christian, and please don't ask me to point this person out because I don't know who or where they are who would believe that. Okay, the Christian narrative about Jesus and Son of God and, and virgin birth and all that stuff that's still intact, and he was introducing psychedelic mushrooms as well. And that has to be in play, too, here, because, as you'll hear, that's kind of in play for Jerry. And then there's this vast middle ground of, you know, who was this figure, Jesus? What role have these psychedelics, uh, I hate the term ethnogens, but, you know, what role have they played in the development of of religions, of wisdom traditions, of people just experiencing these extended realms. So really interesting topic, a lot to pull apart there, and we try and do it all in this interview with Dr. Jerry Brown. Today we welcome Jerry B. Brown to Skeptico. Jerry is an anthropologist who, along with his wife Julie, who is a psychotherapist, have written The Psychedelic Gospels, The Secret History of Hallucinogens in Christianity. Jerry, welcome to Skeptico. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you, Alex. So, Jerry, this idea that psychedelics have somehow played a role in Christianity and in a broader sense, maybe some or all of the world's religions, is something that's been out there for a while and has picked up some steam in the last 20 years or so. But it looks like you're really bringing something new to this discussion, certainly a rigor and a research academic background that I don't know has been there before. Was that your intent? And how did you get started in, in looking at this? Well, let me, let me start off by talking about uh, how we got started in looking at this and then come back to your question about you know, the, the rigor, etc., uh, I'm an anthropologist by training, and after my first um, LSD experience, um, I, which was, I was in a tumultuous time in my life, and uh, the set that I came into it was uh, quite unsettling, and I had a difficult experience. And I took it as both a challenge and an opportunity to learn more, much more about psychedelics. And so as a founding professor, of anthropology at Florida International University in Miami, I designed and uh, taught in 1975, of course, called Hallucinogens and Culture, which was 
still offered today. It might be the first university catalog course for credit course on psychedelics uh, in the U.S. I'm, I, I'm not positive about that. In any case, um, in the process, uh, and I can talk more about the course. It was. It starts out with indigenous use of uh, hallucinogens and psychedelics, entheogens and shamanism. Moves on to classical cultures of Greece and India, and uh, concludes with the what I call the modern psychonauts, the Timothy Learys, the uh, Ramdas is the uh, John Lillies of the world. So in the process, I became quite familiar with ethnobotany um, and the ethnomycology, the way in which different cultures uh, use and relate to the mushroom world. Then in 2006, on an anniversary trip to Scotland, uh, my wife Julie and I decided to visit Roslyn Chapel, inspired by the mention of Roslyn in uh, Dan Brown's book and uh, film, The Da Vinci Code. Now, Jerry, let me just interject with a quick question here. At this point, did you have any sense that you were going to investigate this connection further, this long interest you'd had in hallucinogens and the early Christian kind of perspective? Did you have any sense of that? None whatsoever. In fact, quite the contrary. Uh, as we point out in the book, uh, having... Um, you know, cut my teeth on the ground bait breaking and pioneering studies of Gordon Wasson, who, whose poetic writings and erudite research gave wings to the young field of ethnomycology. Uh, I also had accepted his authoritative conclusion that uh, psychedelics, or as we like to call them, entheogens, plants that and chemicals that generate the divine within, that entheogens had ended a thousand years in, 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 in uh, the Judeo-Christian tradition, had ended a thousand years before the coming of Christianity. So I had kind of closed that door with many other scholars, taken Wasson's uh, observations as correct, and had no inkling prior to visiting Roslyn Chapel and the events that unfolded after that fateful visit that I would ever be researching this topic, not, not in a million years. Let me just ask you, you tell a great story in the book about the experience that you had sitting in this cafe. You're exhausted from the trip. It's a great story. Can, can you retell it? I think it's a, such a great turning point in the book. Sure. So, so at Roslyn, I was fascinated by these hundred green men because Roslyn is a synthesis. It's a Catholic church, but it is an 15th century, incredible synthesis of pagan and Catholic symbolism. And there are over a hundred green men there, and there, protruding down from the ceiling in a stone boss, is uh, what I consider to be. Explain the green men thing. The green green men are fertility symbols. They have a kind of fierce fecundity about them. Uh, they're found throughout Europe. Uh, there are taverns named the green man, uh, but green man images from India. You can find them from India to Europe in churches and in other places. Kind of gargoyle-ish looking things, if you didn't. Uh, not not yeah, really, but not in that as, general. Not as, not as uh, grotesque as gargoyles, but certainly interesting faces with uh, a variety of emotional expressions and very often with vines and tendrils growing out of the eyes, growing into the nostrils around the mouth. So they're, uh, they're wrapped in earth symbolism. And this one particular green man head that, that kind of uh, glares enigmatically and somewhat sardonically down from the ceiling, right over the most sacred part of the church, the, the altars in the front where worship is conducted and mass is conducted. Uh, I found a, moment, a, a plaster replica of this grand man head in the gift shop in Roslyn Chapel, bought it, put it into my knapsack. And then Julie and I traveled a little more and we, we came to visit St. Andrews. And uh, when we arrived in St. Andrews, uh, hot, thirsty, and fatigued from our trip out of the Cairngorm Mountains in Scotland, we drove. Um, I put this, Julie had gone to the ladies' room. I put the green man, I reached for the map. I found the green man head. I put it down on the table, the red and white checkered table in this Italian restaurant, and absentmindedly turned it around 180 degrees and found myself staring at a replica, a sculptured replica of a psychedelic Amanita muscaria mushroom sculpted upside down into the forehead, right over the pineal gland of this green man. Did you recognize it immediately? I did. 
And as a as someone who's schooled in botany, as you were, you know, because you'd investigated all this, what would tell you that that was that particular mushroom? And what did that mean to you at the time? Did you immediately make that connection? Uh, yes, I immediately made that connection. Uh, it was the you know, it, it was represented the, the stages of the growth of Amanita. It had the bulb at the bottom. It had the veil where the Amanita uh, sheds when it comes up white. And then this white veil uh, peels back, revealing the red mushroom, ending up the white. So it ends up red with sort of white speckles or dots on it, which are the remains of the white filament or veil. And there it was. And uh, a few years later, when we were well writing the book, I ran into, uh, Julie and I had dinner with Paul Stamets, the eminent um, uh, mycologist, one of the most eminent mycologists in the world. And I asked Paul, Paul, um, I've, I've identified this as Amanita muscaria, and I'd appreciate it if, if you would uh, take a look at it. He looked at it and he said, this is a taxonomically correct Amanita muscaria. And I said, are you sure? And he said, absolutely. He laughs. He pulls out his laptop, uh, Paul Stamets, and he shows me his other pictures of other mushrooms that he found during his visit to Roslyn Chapel. So now not only had I identified it, but um, one of the world's most eminent mycologists, uh, Paul Stamets, confirmed the identification uh, as atomic, taxonomically correct. This is the Amanita muscaria, which is used in ritual shamanism by the 300,000 reindeer herders who are spread throughout Russia from uh, Siberia all the way to central uh, Russia, all the way over to the uh, Scandinavian peninsula. It is also the famous Soma of the Hindu Rig Veda, which was identified by Gordon Wasson in his ground great ground break, which was identified by Gordon Wasson in his groundbreaking and seminal book, Soma, Divine Mushroom of Immortality, as the enigmatic plant uh, that was worshipped as a god, a plant, and the juice of the plant in the Hindu Rig Veda, a 3,500-year-old, one of the world's oldest religious scriptures and one of the oldest Vedas. So what's the significance of finding this in Roslyn Chapel? Okay, so here, what is this saying to us? What is this telling us that there's a psychoactive mushroom in, uh, sculpted in one of the most prominent sacred places of Roslyn Chapel? What was William St. Clair, the founder of Roslyn Chapel, trying to communicate, if anything. And now my, our minds started racing. Did it mean, was this a hint that there were psychoactive plants in Christian art? Would there be other churches that had psychoactive plants? Was this a secret practice that went back all the way through Christian history, through medieval times to early Christian church, even into the life of Jesus and the disciples? In other words, was this the original Eucharist? So now our heads are spinning. We're speculating wildly. We have challenged what we know is reasonable. We have come to the almost the rambunctious overthrow of reason. And then the words of Carl Sagan, the famous astrophysicist, stopped us. And Carl Sagan, among many wonderful sayings, said, extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. I just have to stop you there. That's a pet peeve of mine. That is about the worst the misrepresentation of what science is all about that I've ever heard. There, There is, you know this as an anthropologist, that is completely wrong. Science is science. We can't have a layer on top of it that says this is extraordinary and we need extraordinary claims for that. But not at all. I, I, I take exception with you. Uh, when, when Darwin wrote um, Evolution, when he wrote Origin of Species, he went, he knew this was an extraordinary claim. And Wasson's been compared to Darwin, uh, I don't think fairly, but he, he knew, especially even though there were 100 years of evolutionary writings before him, the, the blowback that was going to come. When yeah, he, but hold on, hold on. Uh, I don't want to get us too far afield here. The point is just this. The enterprise of science is to remove us from our bias, to set up the peer review process, the evaluation by our peers. So that institution and that system Science is a method. It's it's not a position statement. Should remove us from the need for ex saying extraordinary this, extraordinary that. It's beside the point. No, nope, it's it's not beside the point because in making the claims that we were going to make, John Allegro made these claims 
uh, years ago in the 1960s uh, in his book, uh, The Sacred Mushroom and the Cross. He did it on the basis of dubious linguistic evidence. And uh, his career, uh, and he, he also made the uh, what I think the outrageous claim that Jesus did not exist as a historical person, but was actually a metaphor for the psychedelic mushroom. And the entire Old and New Testament was a hidden code for psychedelic mushrooms. Uh, his, his career was destroyed over it. His daughter and biographer, Judith Brown, who wrote the book, um, you know, John Marco Allegro, Maverick, Maverick of the Dead Sea Scrolls, he was an eminent Dead Sea scroll, scholar, said, had he had more images, he only had one of psychedelics and Christian art, which is included in our book from Plain Corral, France, maybe his work would have been better received. So I knew the history of this, and I knew that we better have extraordinary evidence and that we needed to undertake a journey throughout Europe and the Middle East to examine churches, cathedrals, abbeys, um, uh, chapels, to see if we could find other visual evidence of psychedelics prominently displayed in Christian art. And by that, I mean in stained glass windows, in illuminated or, or Bibles, Bibles with drawings in, in, in them, in sculpture, in mosaics, in frescoes. And indeed we did. Help me understand what you were looking for at that point, because, you know, one of the problems with this topic, and you alluded to it a little bit, is one, atheistic folks latch on to this idea, like you just said, and it's not just Allegro. Many people since have said, you know, it's it's a way to kind of write off Christianity and religion in general. Hey, it's there's nothing divine. There's no extended consciousness realm. It's just people tripping, you know, that's all it is. So there's that part of it. But then there's also the, the deep spirituality part that says this is some doorway connection to these extended consciousness realms that join all religions. So I, I guess one question would be, at this point, did you have some bias? And then my follow-on question is going to be, how do you sort out those two very different kind of uh, conclusions or, or ways to take the, the basic idea that uh, hallucinogens, ethnogens are somehow at play with the spiritual experience? That's a really excellent, excellent question. And as we say in the invitation to readers at the beginning of our book, uh, that Julie and I had our initial experiences with the divine through psychedelics in the 1960s and 1970s. And we saw them in our own personal experience as a pathway um, to the divine presence or whatever you would like or, or, or the, in the intelligence that runs and permeates the universe uh, as, as LSD research has indicated. And so we did not see this as a confirmation of atheistic thinking. We knew that uh, shamanistic cultures throughout history and including many that are living today in South America and Africa and Asia use psychedelics as the portal to the supernatural and the divine world. We don't see this as conflicting with that. In fact, we quote uh, Brother David Stendhal Rost, who is from the a priest from the Order of St. Benedict, who said the following. If I can experience God through a sunset on a mountaintop, why not through a mushroom prayerfully ingested? So we came down and, and there is much research, including the uh, miracle at Marsh Chapel, which proved that synthetic psilocybin in a double blind experiment conducted in 1962 uh, by Walter Pankey could create authentic mystical experiences. We better back up there. And why don't you talk through that experiment real briefly? And there's a couple points I want you to touch on afterwards. One is synthetic, because that then takes us out of the the natural part of it and, and some of that some of the shamanistic stuff has to be kind of called into question there and the other thing is when you say the the, the experience you know the divine experience or then what are we really talking about because that asks the question of is it an experience or is it something 
uh, more, you know, because we can have experiences, but those don't necessarily suggest that there is an extended consciousness realm. I've probably laid too much on the table there, but tell us about that experiment. Not at all. Not at all. Let me let me walk you through um, the this. And just to, to put one point aside, uh, Wasson found a li- li- this is about synthetics. Wasson found a living mushroom cult among the Mazatec uh, Indians of uh, Oaxaca in Mexico. And he went down there and he was invited and he participated in psilocybin uh, mushroom experiences. Uh, that material of psilocybin mushrooms was sent to Albert Hoffman, the discoverer of LSD, uh, who was a chemist, a pharmacist, a pharmacologist at his lab in, uh, in Switzerland. He was able to make synthetic psilocybin. It was brought to Maria Sabina, the famous uh, Mazatec shamanist, and she found it to be the same experience. So it's interesting on that count. It is also interesting that um, Houston, uh, the famous uh, scholar of religion, gave um, independent objective readers LSD writings and writings of Christian mystics, and they couldn't tell which were which. So I just wanted to make that point. Now, to come back to your basic question about the miracle of Marsh Chapel, also known as the Good Friday Experience, this took place. um, It was conducted by Walter Pankey, who designed it under Timothy Leary's Harvard Psilocybin Project, obviously before Leary and his colleagues were um, expelled from the Harvard faculty. What they did was on Good Friday, 1962, Pankey divided, randomly divided, 20 volunteer Protestant divinity students into two groups in a small chapel uh, in, in Marsh, uh, in the under, under rooms of Marsh Chapel. Half of the students received capsules containing 30 milligrams of milligrams of psilocybin, and the other half received a placebo, niacin, uh, vitamin B3, which makes you feel flushed. The results were compelling. Nine out of the 10 subjects, divinity students, who received psilocybin reported profound mystical experiences. And only one of the control group uh, did this. Uh, In fact, um, the uh, Houston Smith, who then was a student, went on to write several books about entheogenic plants. He described this Marsh Chapel Express session as one of the most powerful cosmic, as the most powerful cosmic homecoming I have ever experienced. 25 years later, Rick Doblin, the founder of MAPS, the Multidisciplinary Association for Psychedelic Studies, maps.org, did a follow-up study. He found seven of those nine students who had the mystical experience, and they confirmed that it was among the either the most profound or one of the most profound and lost long lasting events in their life. So all this gives us sound experimental evidence that these experiences are for the subjects real. And, and Walter Clark, a famous American psychologist wrote, there are no experiments known to me in the history of the scientific study of religion better designed or clearer in this conclusion than this one. I love this study because it creates an illuminating and a unique fusion, Alex, between science uh, and religion. You know, some people would scoff at that. Uh, One of the things that I think is interesting about it, and I love the way you highlight it, but I think we should draw it out even further. So these are divinity students. And the reason we think that maybe is significant is we think, hey, maybe these people have some experience with what we're all pointing to and saying is uh, there's something out there that's that's real in terms of this whole religious spiritual experience and they're kind of more familiar with it than the rest of the population i mean i don't know that's just kind of implied in the study but i think it's interesting but here's where i guess i was really uh kind of getting at with that and we chatted a little bit yesterday and i told you about kind of skeptico and more, I don't want to say the mission, but what we always wind up talking about is that consciousness and this idea that there are these extended realms that we're kind of assuming as part of this discussion, you know, that's really on the outside 
of science as we know it. It's certainly on the outside of neuroscience. It's certainly on the outside of medicine. And you can talk about the experimental work that's being done with psychedelics and for treatment of post-traumatic stress or addiction. Hey, fabulous, all that stuff. But it's all based on the premise that you are just your brain and there's nothing more. So uh, talk for a minute, if you will. I mean, connect the dots there in terms of how we how how your research how your investigation gets by this underlying assumption that we are merely a product of our brain yeah that is an assumption of western science just as the newtonian worldview was the fundamental paradigm of western science before it was replaced by quantum mechanics. And if you're familiar with Thomas Kuhn's The Structure of Scientific Revolution, you know, science moves along with people filling in the different pieces of the existing paradigm until enough contrary evidence builds up. Yeah, but we've had a hundred we've had a hundred years of contrary evidence. And your your friend that you're mentioning uh, you know, a minute ago, Carl Sagan the late great Carl Sagan, the all the evidence was there. It's it's a, a rather organized, concerted effort to ignore the evidence, ignore the data, and continue on this paradigm that is a non-starter for this whole discussion. I, I guess I really want to th throw that out there because I don't know how we're going to do this end run around uh, around the consciousness problem. What, what is... I don't think it's an end run, and I understand very much why um, you know your, your program is called Skeptico, and I respect that very much, and you're asking very important questions. I believe in my own, uh, in uh, chapter six of the book, The Miracle of Marsh Chapel, I start out with my own experience of what I can only consider to be a divine presence coming into my life in a psychedelic uh, psilocybin experience. And I was skeptical until that happened, I, to be very honest. Well, let's, let's make sure we're talking about the same thing. I'm skeptical of science as we know it, that insists that your consciousness is an epiphenomena of your brain. I'm extremely skeptical of that because I think the evidence doesn't support that. And yet it is the fundamental paradigm of neuroscience, of psychology, of biology. I mean, you go through, you go into the social sciences, anthropology. It is, it is a crazy, bizarre assumption that's being made. So just so we're on the same page there. Great. We are definitely on the same page. And then I agree. I agree with you completely. And uh, I in terms of everything I've read, in terms of the information that continues to come out about these uh, spiritual and mystical experiences that people have uh, from all different backgrounds uh, in uh, with uh, psychedelics, I come to the same conclusion. And I would defer, of course, to Stanislav Grof who has conducted more psychedelic trips. He's the father of LSD uh, psychotherapy and written more books on this subject than, than any person uh, in the world. Uh, he looks at, he has a book, one of it calls, it's called When the Impossible Happens. Of all these kinds of experiences from improbable synchronicities to alien visitations that just do not fit within the realm of normal science. And that's why Groff, after decades of the studies of consciousness, uh, particularly through the use of psychedelics, which he considers to be to the mind, as the telescope was to astronomy, as the microphone, as the microscope uh, was to biology. And I quote Groff, I say, I now firmly believe that consciousness is more than an accidental byproduct of the neurophysiological and biochemical processes taking place in the human brain. I see consciousness in the human psyche as expressions and reflections of a cosmic intelligence that permeates the entire universe and all of existence. We are not just highly evolved animals with biological computers embedded inside our skulls. We are also fields of consciousness without limits, transcending time, space, matter, and linear causality. I think that's where we're going. So Jerry, let's get back to talking about the book, but let's pick up right there. So what do you think is going on with the psychedelic experience in relation to what you just said about Groff? 
about Stan. Okay. Goff. So how is how how are we being connected? Because we keep talking about, and I think it is directly relevant to the book. We keep talking about the divine and the connection to the divine, divine, and we're going to talk in a minute about the religions that maybe have sprouted from this. Well, we have to kind of have some idea of what we think is going on with these compounds. What are they connecting us with? So what they're connecting us with is this broader transhuman or transpersonal consciousness, this river of consciousness that flows through the universe. And we're a manifestation of it. We're a manifestation of the cosmos participating in its coevolution and conversing and interacting with it. And I want to bring this back specifically to the book because I don't think and you know, not not complaining because we've we're gone into very important areas. But I want to touch on how this relates to the book. The first question of the book is, are there psychedelics and theogens in Christian art? Our answer is, we believe convincingly, yes, as shown by the multiple images that we found in France and England and Scotland and Germany and Italy and the Middle East and Turkey and Egypt. Number two, why are these images there? And we, we, we agree with Pope Gregory, who in the sixth century said, let art be the instruction, be the biblical religious instruction of the illiterate, because people couldn't read up until after the Gutenberg galaxy and the printing press. And so we think they are there because they reveal a truth that is sacred to Christianity, that divinity can be directly experienced, the divine presence of Jesus and the saints, or whatever form divinity takes in other religions, can be experienced existentially and directly through these plants. And that's the reason that they were there. And we connect that back by a rereading since there was no Christian art before 200 AD for a variety of reasons. We go back into the gospels and to the canonic gospels and even into the Gnostic gospels and look at them in the context of our theory of the psychedelic gospels and believe they were present in the life of Jesus in the disciples. So that's why they're there. And I know uh, it's difficult. I encourage your, your listeners to um, you know look at our website, psychedeliggospels.com or to purchase our book through Amazon or any other bookseller, uh, The Psychedelic Gospels, because the visual imagery is uh, a compelling part of the argument. So that's why we believe they were there. We find that if we link this to current research, these amazing breakthroughs that are happening with the use of MDMA, uh, with post-traumatic stress disorder, and with psilocybin, with term relieving anxiety and depression among terminally ill cancer patients, in one session, and the researchers at NYU and John Hopkins say the relief that people found from depression, these terminal cancer patients, and anxiety was directly related to the intensity of the mystical experience. Okay, and let me just emphasize one thing you said. There are some beautiful reproductions in the book in full color that really come through and are an important part of this story. So we got to encourage anyone who's interested in this to pick up, uh, you know, a hard copy or I mean, a, a soft paperback copy of the book is really great. It's, it really works. It's all really. paper. It's all paper or, or Kindle. But let me pursue this one more well, step. Well, what I want you to pursue, though, because when you pursue that, the, the, the big gap when you say, you know, it's a leap to say, are, start with question one, are they there? And you convincingly say, yes, they're there. And then you say why they're there. But there's kind of a big gap, because when we talk about Christianity, when you talk about even the life of Jesus, I mean, highly controversial among many, many biblical scholars, and we've had a lot of them on this show, in terms of... Uh, even connecting this art and some of the stories that are this art depicts from the Bible are highly questionable in terms of whether those are real historical events. There's also that connection that we have to kind of make in terms of if a lot of people are having the psychedelic experience and the connection to the divine, does that necessarily connect to 
Christian history in the way that you're connecting it. Right. Okay. First of all, we know uh, from the anthropological record that many cultures have used psychedelics and continue to use them in the religious experience. We know that right. Christianity evolved in a circum-Mediterranean area that was rife with mystery cults and um, esoteric religions, including the Greek Eleusinian mysteries, which went on from 1500 BC to 400 AD when Christianity became the official religion of the Roman Empire. So we know that that was in the area and that knowledge of it, including in ancient Egypt, was fairly common. Number two, uh, we know that um, the there are multiple pathways. We are not saying that psychedelics are the only pathway to experience the divine. Um, there are multiple pathways that different cultures have explored, but this is definitely one of them. And number three, let me come back because I think it's very important that your listeners understand what we're talking about in the artwork. Let me take you to uh, plate six in our book in the tiny uh, church, parish church of St. Martin de Vic in central France. We walk into this church. There are beautiful, beautiful thousand year old frescoes on the wall. And here is um, Christ entry into Jerusalem. Christ is riding on the ass. His disciples are walking behind him and the joyful youth who are greeting him. This is plate six in the book, The Psychedelic Gospels, are holding on not to palm leaves, but to the stem of a group of five large tan psilocybin mushrooms. And size matters in Romanesque art, and these are very large, as large almost as the heads of the youth, because the artist is saying to us that this is important. Unmistakable, unmistakable, and anyone can get it, plate six, it's right there, the mushrooms. Now go read biblical scholar Robert Price about what he thinks about the likelihood and the the, the extremely uh, just un impossible to fathom story that this was a historical event, that this person, Jesus, even if we accept that there was this historical Jesus, was riding on the ass of a donkey into Jerusalem. He will shred that to pieces. So that's my point. Yeah, you, no. the, the, either it, it, it not the, both don't one doesn't lead to the other. This doesn't. I, I, I do get to you. I do get your point. And I, I can cite other religious scholars who will, who will, you know, counter that and, and argue that this was uh, an historical event. As we go down and as Julie and I looked to the next wall perpendicular to this one, there's the towers of Jerusalem. And there's the youth again on top of these towers cutting down with long knives, psychedelic mushrooms. And if that's not enough, that towers of Jerusalem are over the next fresco which is a broad table depicting the Last Supper with Jesus and his disciples, with Judas on the other side of the table. And what's on the table? These same mushroom caps with the same long knives. And if that's not enough, if that's not sufficient, the artist has skillfully drawn mushrooms into the hems of the disciples. In other words, the artists are telling us, at least for these artists, these Benedictine monks who made these frescoes at this time in the early 12th century, the 1100s, these were prominently displayed. Art historians, some art historians have called these branches or trees because they don't know mycology. And this is part of the problem we've had is because theologians, art historians, church historians, tour guides, they don't know mycology. They, as one of them said to me, one of prominent art historian, I wouldn't know a mushroom if I saw one. So this is why we need an interdisciplinary approach. And this is why we call Julie and I for the establishment of an interdisciplinary committee to evaluate this controversial theory. Right. And, you know, we're <laughs> we're like connecting on 90 percent of this and we're just kind of talking past each other on the rest. So great, great work fantastic deconstruction of this art. And we will have to talk about how other people haven't done quite as good a job. And while let's stop and talk about that now, because other people have taken on this task and it's turned into this wild mushroom hunt where mushrooms start popping up everywhere. So maybe we return to an earlier question of, you know, the rigor that must be 
uh, applied to carefully narrowing our focus in terms of what is a, a mushroom and what isn't, right? Do you want to talk about that at all? No, a- absolutely. And, and this has been uh, by the works of certain scholars who start to see mushrooms everywhere, uh, a disservice uh, to those of us who are, who are trying to uh, establish uh, a scientific basis and a peer review conversation regarding, um, you know, the holy mushroom theory and its role in Christianity and in other religions. Um, the disservice comes about in several ways. One, uh, in, you know, the, the basic rule of anthropology is you have to go do field work. You have to go to the site. You have to live it. You have to breathe it. You have to look at it from every direction, linguistically, uh, culturally, historically. Uh, what if you're going to do this and an armchair approach, these scholars are going to pull images from different churches off of the Internet. And in doing so, these images are hard to decipher or they're corrupted and they're going to make mistakes. For example, in one of the images, Julie and I were planning based on one of these scholars um, uh, representations. Which scholar? This in this case, this is Jan Irwin in his book, The Holy Mushroom. And he shows an image of um, the uh, St. Valburga uh, from the Abbey of Eichstadt in Germany holding a white stem. And it has a mushroom, uh, what looks like a red and white cap on the top of it. We were about, as we, and as we describe in the chapter uh, on uh, uh, St. Bernard's secret, we were about to go off to um, uh, Eichstadt, uh, to the Wahlberg uh, the uh, Abbey of Eichstadt near Munich to photograph and look at this when looking at this image that we were carrying with us from um, Irwin's book, uh, Julie looked at it and said, wait, that has a square bottom and it has uh, straight lines drawn across uh, what's supposed to be the mushroom bulb. That's not a bulb. That's a veil. And it's reputed that that St. Valborga uh, had a, 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 an ointment, a healing ointment started leaking from her, her relics and that that was collected and, and is the object of the worship of pilgrims and visitors who go there. And then we had to say, thank goodness we saw this. So one, it's this, the depiction or the interpretation of images that look like mushrooms as mushrooms. Secondly, it results in seeing mushrooms where there are no mushrooms. The cover of our book uh, indicates is, is taken from the Great Canterbury Psalter, and it's from a drawing uh, in the beginning of this illuminated Bible that shows God creating plants, as the Latin says. It, but when you look at it, it's not God creating plants. If you look at the cover of our book, it's God creating uh, psychoactive red and white Amanita mushrooms and also uh, psilocybin mushrooms, which turn a characteristic blue when exposed to oxygen. Well, another author, um, Rush, says that Jesus has something in his hands. And there is nothing in his hand when you get a clear image, which we did from the uh, French National Library, where the original uh, Saint, uh, Canterbury Psalter is. So this becomes another problem. The third problem is not only when you see mushrooms where there are none and you don't do the anthropological field work on the site, but then you start to say, as Rush does, that since the mushroom is so important, there are many metaphors for it, a halo, blood, nails, etc. And we have to develop a symbolism. And this, under that framework, anything you want to, almost anything you can look at can have a possible mushroom imagery in it. No, I don't want to say it that way. There are many symbols that can be interpreted as mushrooms. So we uh, argue vigorously against this approach. We argue for in-depth field work. And we know that given, as we've said, the controversial nature of our theory, we call for the uh, establishment of an interdisciplinary committee of recognized scholars who will evaluate our work, which we believe and I don't say this lightly, is as significant as the finding of the Dead Sea Scrolls and the Gnostic Gospels to a reinterpretation, potential reinterpretation of Christianity. 
What is that reinterpretation? Okay, so here's the big payoff. What's the reinterpretation of Christianity? What's the bottom line? And in particular, because a lot of Christian people, and I'm not a Christian, but a lot of Christian people, what is the reinterpretation of the life of Jesus? The reinterpretation is that during the missing years, uh, Jesus could have gone to India, but we all we argue that he went to Egypt where he learned these sacred rites that were practiced by the Egyptians to leave the body and return while alive and to become a being of light. And he learned the rituals of the sacred mushrooms, which he incorporated into his teachings and into his healings. So in other words, if our theory is correct, then the master story of Christianity would have to be dramatically revised to incorporate the role of psychedelics in the teaching and healing mission of Jesus. And in plate 14 of our book, there's a very interesting photo that we display of uh, Jesus on his healing mission after he is baptized by John the Baptist. And it is him uh, placing his head um, on the leper's head. And the Latin scrolls uh, say the following. The, um, The leper says, For example, uh, Jesus says to the leper, you know, do you want to be cleansed? And, um, you know, and the leper says to Jesus, Master, if you want to, you may cleanse me. And the leper says back, I want to be cleansed. But the scroll that the leper is holding unfolds not to Jesus, but to a psychedelic mushroom that Jesus is suspended above. And we know that in many shamanic cultures, uh, psychedelics, ayahuasca, Ibogaine, um, psilocybin, uh, peyote among the huichol and the cora of Mexico were used for healing. So here is a direct reference, reference to it. To take this even further, Alex, what does it mean? And we want to talk about enigmatic. Let's look at the New Testament Gospel of John, John 6, 51 through 56, where Jesus says, um, Whoever, whoso eateth of my flesh and drinketh my blood hath eternal life. And I will raise him up on the last day. He that eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood dwelleth in me and I in him. Now, look, we do not believe that Jesus was encouraging cannibalism. This would have been uh, anathema, repugnant uh, to both Romans and Jews alike. And the early Christians were all Jews. We believe that he is talking about the sacred mushroom. And I can take that further because in the chapter on the kingdom of heaven, we go back into the Gnostic gospels, which were supposedly the, the representations and the words of the, of the living Jesus and were, were buried in the sands of Egypt from uh, 200 on. And Jesus says to his disciples, it's in the gospel of Thomas, compare me to someone and tell me who I'm like. And Thomas replies, master, my mouth is wholly incapable of saying whom you are like. And Jesus says, I am not your master. Because you have drunk, you have become intoxicated from the bubbling spring, which I have measured out. He who drinketh from my mouth will become like me. I shall become he, and the things that are hidden will be revealed to him. Now listen here, uh, for those of you who, who are not familiar with this passage. He is saying to Thomas, you have drunk. You have become intoxicated and visionary from this drink that I have measured out. In other words, Jesus is saying, I measured it out. I know the dose. And if you drink from what I offer, you will become like me. You will have a transpersonal, mystical experience. And I will become like you and all things that are hidden will be revealed. And as Jesus said, the kingdom of heaven, lo, look not here or there. The kingdom of heaven is within. So we believe this is in the language of that time a reference to saying that this heavenly world, this supernatural world, this mystical world, which gets described in different terms in different cultures, is revealed from within by taking this drink from the psychoactive plants. That's where we really believe there is a revision of the master story of Christianity. But it is not a destruction of belief in Jesus or a destruction. Wait a minute. I've heard you say this before. Do you think for a second that this idea that recasting uh, Jesus from this uh, born of a virgin, son of God, God on earth, 
being to someone who's well schooled in and theogens and healing do you th I, I i just there 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 is no way that's going to fly with modern day christianity well it flies with brother david stendel rost and and hear me out on this because whether you believe in all the other uh, stories about the bible you can and it is not contradictory to a belief system that says that Jesus was the son of God, if that is your belief, to contemplate that he could have realized his divinity through entheogens, his, his divinity and sense of immortality, which is what we hear that these psychedelic plants do from Soma in the Rig Veda. Jerry, this Jesus plus thing just isn't going to fly. I mean, we, we got to kind of get down to the core issue of who was Jesus and, and, and are you suggesting that Jesus was this magician or herbalist who was a healer or is he this divine being? And, and for, I guess to start there, we have to say, do we believe that there are divine beings? Do we believe that there are beings that are somehow different, are somehow straddling this extended consciousness realm and this realm? What, what do you think about that question? And then uh, the big question is, who was Jesus? Alex, I believe we're all divine beings. We're, that's, and we all can realize that through psychedelics or other pathways to the divine. And I think that's what the teaching was. And this is what we find in the Gnostic Gospels, that Jesus did not come to save humanity from sin, but to teach enlightenment, that God and man were not other, but are one. And this is the teachings of the Gnostic Gospels. We believe this is part of the two true teachings of early Christianity. And that's where uh, certainly there's going to be dispute with Orthodox Orthodox. Christianity. But think about it for a minute. The visionary experience, the inspired experience, the mystical experience is very prized throughout the Bible from the early Old Testament to certainly the book of Revelation. And so if we're going to move in a paradigm shift from ritual at the beginnings to analysis of Christian texts and, and, um, and gospels, uh, from the printing press on to now considering that all of us can have a direct experience of the divine, no matter in what is your religious framework, whether it be Hindu, whether it be a uh, Judaic, whether it be those people, those many people who in the Pew survey say, I am spiritual and not religious, because look at this, we are all looking for our place in the cosmos. Um, and if psychedelics provides one for some portion of the population, this is why Julie and I, in our book, encourage the foundation of sacred centers as legal, the legalization of psychedelics to be used in sacred centers for personal growth and religious exploration, which should be uh allowed under the First Amendment of the United States Constitution, which requires that there be no prohibition on the freedom of religion. Now, coming back to the more controversial issue, look, it took 300 years for the Catholic Church to forgive, to, to apologize to Galileo for showing him during the Inquisition uh, the instruments of torture to get him to recant what he saw through his telescope. We hope it will not take 300 years uh, for the Catholic Church or for Judaism, which we couldn't get into in this book, to acknowledge the role of psychedelics as having a valuable experiential and existential contribution to people's religious experience. Very well said. And it's a huge, huge topic that you're tackling here and you're just doing it in a very thoughtful, deep way. One last question or question area that you just kind of dipped into with that last response. And that is, you know, what do we make of the dark, deep state part of this? So anyone who's looked into LSD, uh, psilocybin as well, you know, you're going to run into MK Ultra. You're going to run into Timothy Leary being co-opted by the FBI and the CIA. Uh, we're going to run into mind control. It's not all white light when we look at 
psychedelics is it? And do you have concerns there when you talk about, hey, you know, the, the freedom of expression, the freedom of thought, the freedom to do what you want with your consciousness? This seems to be a topic that the deep state is very interested in and has been in for quite a while. And their read of what our rights should be seems to be quite different than what you're talking about. Yeah, we, we touch on that in a footnote because, look, we couldn't touch on get into Judaism in this book. We couldn't get into these deep state arguments. Uh, I, I encourage you to read Acid Dreams, uh, which reveals through freedom of information additional deep state information about the MK Ultra horrible experiments they did on LSD, giving LSD to soldiers without their knowledge or permission, um, et cetera. Both the U.S. and the, and the Soviets uh, explored this as uh, as tools of mind control, as truth serums, as battlefield uh, instruments, um, and uh, they don't seem to work for a variety of reasons. Certainly, that element is there. Uh, we do not explore it in our book, uh, but we do believe that if the theory were true, that the CIA spread psychedelics, including LSD. Uh, throughout the country in order to try to disarm the very powerful civil rights and anti-war movement, they absolutely failed. And the success of the counterculture in many ways in which it has become almost uh, embedded into many aspects of American life, whether it be in, in food or protest or cultural styles, and now the current resurgence of the psychedelic renaissance, which is avoiding the mistakes that Leary and the others made, uh, perhaps out of innocence, perhaps out of over enthusiasm, uh, by false, uh, you know, overly promising what these drugs can do, but by putting these substances through the rigorous scientific and medical methodology of showing how they can help with Alzheimer's, with cluster headaches, with, um, with uh, relief for cancer patients, with helping first um, responders and our veterans who come back traumatized from war, this is the way that which psychedelics are going to enter the mainstream. In other words, as we saw with marijuana, legalization follows medicalization, and the medicalization model is what's driving this new science of psychedelics. We touch on that in the last chapter of our book, and I encourage your listeners, you can find us at, you can find all of this on our website, psychedelicgospels.com, or you can find our book on Amazon, The Psychedelic Gospels, or you can follow our page on Facebook, Psychedelic uh, Gospels. Excellent. Once again, our guest has been Dr. Jerry B. Brown, who, along with his wife, who really is featured pretty prominently in the book and played an important role in it, Julie Brown. They together wrote The Psychedelic Gospels, The Secret History of Hallucinogens in Christianity. Great job, Jerry. Congratulations on a very important work and uh, best of luck with the continued work that you're doing here. Thanks again for joining me. My pleasure. Thanks again to Dr. Jerry Brown for joining me today on Skeptico. As I laid out in the intro and as we hammered on during the interview, the only question to really put on the table here is what are we to make of the fact, and I say fact, that psychedelics were a part of early Christian history? I guess there's a little wiggle room there. You could say, hey, they weren't really a part of early Christian history. They were just introduced in this art hundreds or thousands of years later. Uh, but that doesn't really seem to hold up very well. A anyways, you get the idea. How do you pull that apart? What does this mean for you? I'd love to hear some Christians weigh in on that question. What does this mean for you if you're a non-Christian or if you're looking at this from the outside? So we'd love to get any thoughts you have on that. Of course, the place to do it is through the Skeptico website or through the Skeptico forum, or you can always email me. And don't feel bad if you've listened to this show months and months after it's been out. You can still start a conversation on the Skeptical Forum, and usually people will jump right back in and create that dialogue. Or you can, of course, email me months later. I'm, this is stuff, as you know, that I am interested in and thinking about. So if you're thinking about it too, great. I'd love to connect with you. So I do have a number of interesting shows coming up, twists and turns that I didn't see coming, but that 
add a certain zest to Skeptico. That's it for this episode. Take care. Bye for now. Mm-hmm.